Welcome to Chicago Founder Stories here at 1871, Chicago's digital startup hub. With us tonight, we have the co-founders of Peapod, two great entrepreneurs who founded many ventures together. They also happen to be brothers, Thomas and Andrew Parkinson. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, Pat. Great to have you here. Now, um, Peapod is a name that's been well known. You've been doing this for a long time. Um, but let's go back in time a little bit because uh, you're both obviously brothers. You're a couple years apart, two years apart? Two years. So you've been together your whole life and, and almost your whole life. And so uh, it's been, an, you know, it's, it's an interesting journey to go this long together in this many ventures. It says a lot about the relationship you have and the yin and yang to your relationship. But take us back to the beginning. You know, what, where did you grow up? What were you guys like as, as, as young, young men, as boys? And where, where were you? So we grew up on Long Island in, in New York, and then my parents moved to Connecticut, and we moved uh, there as well. Um, as kids, we loved uh, starting businesses or trying to sell stuff. Uh, we would sell stuff at the end of the driveway. We actually sold dirt, and uh, that was one of the first <laughs> successful ventures. How did um, you differentiate your dirt? <laughs> Well, I'm learning today that there's many different levels of dirt, actually, when you go to. Um, but so we always loved doing things together. And I think one thing that helped was the fact that we did things very differently. He was an art major. I was more on the count the money side. And um, so we never stepped on each other's toes, even in the early days when we were doing those small businesses. So who did what? And didn't you have an egg business? Yeah, so that's what I had when I was um, 11. I built a chicken coop. and. Got 18 chickens and a rooster, and um, I had my first chicken route, uh, egg route, that I would sell the eggs to my neighbors. Um, I broke even on that one. You know, I made just enough money to buy feed to feed the uh, chickens. You got better at picking uh, business models? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. How did you decide to have chickens? I mean, it's very hip today, but may not have been as common in Long Island. And well, my, my science teacher had chickens. So when you know I was in like fifth grade, I went over to his house and I saw his chickens. And from that point on, I needed to have some chickens. So Got it. it wasn't complicated. <laughs> um, OK, and so you try that. Um, other things you did, other things you all did is you know, you had that, that were entrepreneurial. If, if I knew you, if I went to see your neighbors and interviewed them, what would they say about the two of you that reminded them and said, I'm not surprised they're still together doing these kinds of things? Well, I think they would say that we were, we were always up to something. And, you know, um, there was always some idea that we were working on. Um, one of them was when the Pet Rock came out, we said, oh, this, we got to do something like the Pet Rock. So we came out with um, pure canned nuclear waste that we, you could get in a soda can. Um, and we actually went into New York City with a, a, a metal detector, like a Geiger counter, and we were trying to sell it by showing people it. everybody was running away. Okay. So that was kind of a lesson, like you probably want to sell something that people want to, you know, make them happy and want to buy. Yeah. Um, um, and then we, you can tell the keg, keg carrier. Yeah, I think that was a lesson in, in bad marketing, by the way. <laughs> and then in well, the positioning of nuclear <laughs> waste is hard. Let's yeah. be honest. Yeah, it it's hard to position yeah. it as a benefit. I, I don't think we sold a can. No. And it, uh, in college, we went to the same college. And there, we went to the same boarding school and the same college. We did. Yes. And, uh, so, and so, only because we were able to follow my sister, who got into both of those. Right. Otherwise, I don't think we would have gotten in. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, but in college, we um, we were in a fraternity together and saw that it was very difficult in those days to lift kegs because they didn't have handles. And we, in our fraternity, you had to take them up two sets of steps, and they would slip out of your hands and you know fall down and almost hurt your hurt the person carrying it. So we invented this thing called the keg carrier, um, which allowed you it to grab either end of the keg, and then someone could carry it up as steps on the pole uh, with no problem. And the name of that company was Parkinson Products, um, which ties into the Peapod name eventually. Um, and then at the same time, um, Thomas started a t-shirt business in college where we put the whole press and dryer in the basement of the, college, of the fraternity. Well, I had this enormous conveyor belt dryer Wow. on 220 volts that would dry the shirts that, had been, that we had done on the screen. And for the next five years after I left the fraternity, they were chasing me for the electric bill. <laughs> <laughs> so, you were, um, so you were an art major? I was, Studio yes. Art. Studio art. Studio art. I was economics pre-med for like two and a half years. But the other two and a half years? Well, pre-med was tough. <laughs> <laughs> so you yeah. 
Was it the beer drinking that got in the way of the pre-med? There's plenty of that. Um, so which did better, the t-shirts or the keg carrier? Uh, the t-shirts yeah. did really well, actually. So um, yeah, I, did, I made quite a lot of money uh, printing people's t-shirts, but I also came up with an idea uh, for Wesleyan, which is where we went to college. Um, everyone confused it with all these other Wesleyans and also with Wellesley College. So I did this shirt that said Wesleyan not, and it listed all the Wesleyans, and then it said, and it's not an all-girls school outside of Boston. So I sold. Which was changed to it's not an all-woman's school outside yeah. of Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a, a change I had to make. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we sold thousands of those to all the alumni. Oh, nice. You know, for the identity crisis that people had for Wesley. And, uh, and the, the keg carrier, obviously, the market is small on a single campus, so how'd you overcome that? Well, we, we did direct mail, actually, to fraternities, uh, mostly in the Northeast where we were. And we sold a bunch to Dartmouth and some of the heavy drinking schools. <laughs> <laughs> I told them earlier my brother went to Dartmouth, so I can't debate that one. Um, so obviously, you were starting to solve problems you had. Not the nuclear waste one, but the other problems seem to be problems that you had with the uh, keg carrying. But then you get out of college, and uh, it's not necessarily a particularly entrepreneurial time in the economy relative to today. And so you got out first. What did you decide yeah, to do? Yeah, 1980, which was a recession at that point. And so what did you and do? And so what, I went to uh, uh, brand management in, at Procter & Gamble in Cincinnati. And that's where I got exposed to the grocery industry and how much money was spent by the CPG, consumer product companies, in advertising. Um, and By the way, I, anybody want to guess where Andrew went to work when he graduated? Or Thomas. Thomas, sorry, where Thomas went to work when he graduated? <laughs> Procter & Gamble. <laughs> <laughs> together. They stick together. It's, um, so, uh, Andrew, you were saying the, uh, this is an interesting time. Go back for a minute. Talk about what Procter & Gamble was at that time, because I think it'll be interesting to our audience to hear, first, why was it a great place to get experience? But then also, the cast of characters that you overlapped with is really remarkable. Yeah, that's true. Um, I primarily went there because it had what they call brand management, which was really the equivalent of having your own little business. You ran the P&L, and you ran all of the different functions to market the, the brand. My first brand was Pringles, so that was a tough marketing job. But um, you know, that gave you a, a great start in learning how a business works. And I, I mentioned to you, I took over the files from um, uh, Scott Cook, who started- uh, Founded Intuit. Intuit. Um, and also in the, in the food division, which I was in, took over from Meg Whitman, who was eBay. And yeah, then, now um, HP. And then Steve Case, who founded AOL, is, he was a floor above in the soap uh, division. Um, and I have a great, a great memo from him when he was quitting to his boss that said, this place isn't entrepreneurial enough, you know, I'm out of here, basically. And the boss wrote something like, this guy's a joke, he's going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. It, it reminds me of uh, the head of Time Warner who said, when he was asked about Netflix five years ago, he said, it's like being afraid of the Albanian army. <laughs> yeah. And now Netflix is as big as Time Warner, yeah. but it's, uh, there are famous, famous uh, sayings like that. So what is it that attracted those kind of folks, and what are the skills that you think have made the alumni network so successful? You know, primarily I think it's that you know, you're learning how to run all aspects of a business in brand management, and so that's very attractive. And P&G at the time was the best known for that. And of course, with technology and everything taking over, it's a little different today. But back then, you know, we started when there were still typewriters, and that was the place to go if you wanted to learn how to run a brand and marketing. And so then, uh, Thomas, you got out. Talk a little bit about what you did and, and how you spent your time in those few years after. Well, sure. So, I mean, I was graduating with an art major, and my dad said, you know, you got to get a job because you're not living <laughs> at home. And um, he gave me um, $2,500 at graduation and said, this is a loan to get your first apartment. So you can see what kind of uh, parents we had, great parents. Um, I went to Procter & Gamble in sales because I'm all personality, so. Um, <laughs> and I, I was, love the fact that the CTO is Mr. Personality. <laughs> and so I went, I was doing sales, you know, 15 grocery stores a day, selling Folgers coffee and um, Citrus Hill orange juice, which actually Andrew introduced at Procter & Gamble. Um, so, um, but I knew that it wasn't my calling, 
and, um, and I knew that I would never be in the grocery industry again. Forget it. No way. <laughs> and um, so I took an opportunity to move to New York City, because I was in Syracuse, New York at the time, to um, uh, my brother-in-law was just, start, just starting a company, a software company for resume retrieval, search engines for executive recruiters and search firms. So 1984, very, very early search engine technology where recruiters wanted to you know, search, a, search the database for the right candidates. And at the same time, they all wanted to work at home, so I learned everything about modems. And because we were only two people, I learned to code and do everything besides just sales for them. So it was, it was a startup. Right, that was like my real first startup. And how'd that so, go? Uh, it went pretty well. Yeah, we, the, the product was called Placement Power. And we actually sold it to a company here in Chicago that was actually here in the merchandise mart years ago. Hmm. Um, so um, and then I, both of us had our one year midlife crisis when we were um, 20, 28, where I took a year off and traveled around the world with a backpack. And Andrew was on the uh, Olympic windsurfing team. So you got to take that break. First of all, how does one get on the Olympic windsurfing <laughs> yeah. team? And second, when did when did windsurfing become an Olympic sport? Um, this well, is little known fact. In '84. '84. Wow. What happened with me is I was at Proctor. They sent me to Florida for to start start Citrus Hill, which was an orange juice, and I spent all my time windsurfing. So they fired me. And then I went to Kraft Foods and brand management, which is how I landed up here. But I continued to windsurf a lot. And um, by the way, I, I asked the question. We we have this pre discussion before the, and I asked the question. And I, usually you can predict the answer or within, you know, top couple things you would think of. You know, like Family Feud sort of thing. And I said to Andrew, I said, um, so why did you decide to start the business in Chicago? And he said, because I could windsurf. <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought of Chicago as a windsurfing mecca, but you must do a lot in the dry suit. Well, I was looking for a body of water and um, in brand management, so Kraft was a good landing spot. So you're here, and where does the idea of Peapod come from? So I'd seen a lot of research, um, both at Procter and at, at Kraft, that 70% of people disliked shopping for groceries at that point. Also saw that uh, the CPG companies spent the most of anyone in advertising, TV, all types of media. So the original concept was let's um, get people to stare at a screen um, to shop for their groceries, thinking that we could lose money on that and make our money on selling advertising at the point of decision, at the point of purchase. Um, a little miscalculation in terms of how long it would take to get a lot of eyeballs to actually shop online back in 1990. So um, give people a sense. Some people in this room may not have been born in 1990. Others may be too young to really remember much of it. But um, I wasn't on the internet much in 1990. Talk a little bit about what, what was the state of the world of technology and the online world to provide some context for what, what you all did. Yeah. Sure, I mean, I can answer that. So back then it was, um, people were using what's called a bulletin board. Um, there was one called The Well, which was in San Francisco. But it was, a, it was basically chat rooms where everybody could go on. And then also there was Prodigy and AOL was just kind of lighting up also. It was, it was called something else. It was for Radio Shack actually back in the day. It was called Quantum. Quantum, yeah. yeah. And so. It, it was not end up a perfect name because America Online really did put America Online. Yeah. Yeah, oh, for sure. Um, but everything was, you know, dialing into modem. So um, it was, it would take quite How a long time. How many people here have heard of the sound a modem makes? <laughs> oh, pretty good crowd. That's. <laughs> That is like one of those things that dates you, you know, if you know that. Yeah, for sure. Um, but so when we were formulating the idea, um, you know, I knew a lot about modems and I knew how to do all the software development at that point. So, you know, the, the idea started to gel and um, what we knew is we had to come up with some sort of graphical interface. Um, so this was, you know, 1989. So everything was still MS-DOS, very text oriented, but we got very creative with how we use text to make it look graphical. Mm -hmm. So and talk about that a little bit. How did, what were some of the tricks before there was sophisticated you know, graphical user interfaces? What are the things you learned about with less tools about like, how to make it compelling? Right. So I mean, that's where I was lucky that I was an art major. So I kind of really understood you know, early UI back then. Um, and actually, I had just finished going to um, Pratt Institute in industrial design. And I had 
focused on graphical um, design at Pratt Institute. So I had a pretty good sense, plus all the time I had spent at my previous company. So I knew how to build interfaces pretty well. And I knew there, were, there was the ASCII text, which is what everyone's familiar with, but there were also the ANSI characters, which were line draws and things like that. So I was able to use all of that in order to you know, build nice boxes, and they might, you might call it cards now. Um, and then I was able to do things like the Peapod logo, just using characters and the Jewel logo, et cetera. But we had to make it, really the most important thing was to make it super fast. And back then, bulletin boards were running on um, terminals. So you'd see the characters painting across the screen. And I knew that that was not going to cut it with consumers. It was great for geeks, but not for consumers. So we realized we had to write a client server where um, the windows were all rendered by the PC. And the data would come um, as raw data and get parsed into the screen so it would pop and look really great. And I think that was really critical for the design of Peapod when we first Interesting. got it. Interesting. So not unlike a native app today. Not unlike a native app today. Interesting. That's right. Exactly. It was, Way ahead it was of your exactly time. the same yeah. thing. So all the actually a lot of the well, all the screens were pre-built on the disk that we gave you. So you didn't have to send that over. It was already there. So we had a whole set of templates pre-built that we could call and then populate. So the same principle of a native app, which is put the rich user interface, don't send it over the, don't send it exactly. digitally, and then that's right. Just just load the data. That's right. Interesting. Yep. <clears throat> Your time. It was, yeah. it, was, it was it was very fast. That yeah. was what was interesting. It was a 1200, 2400 baud modem, but because it was text, it was very fast, um, such that uh, IBM, which was doing Prodigy at the time, and with a protocol called Naplips, um, it was very slow. They actually called us up and asked to come see uh, Peapod and actually wanted to see whether they could buy it. But this was like in the first year. And when they showed up, they asked us where our mainframe was. And at that point, we were running it on a, um, a Dell 386. Dell 386. And <laughs> we had like eight modems on a uh, crate and barrel wine rack. And that was it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So where did the idea, just to sidebar, where did the idea of, of that architecture come from? What, what where, uh, well, because I had been working at that previous startup um, doing placement power, and I had learned, um, you know, basically through customer feedback that they wanted it to be faster at at at, um, at home over, and this was like with acoustic couplers. I mean, we're talking, you know, three hundred baud kind of kind of stuff. So at that company, we started to learn. Okay, let's let's pre-build things on their side so that you don't have to wait for it to come over the modem. So it was really bandwidth constraints. And you know, with the internet today, you don't have those bandwidth constraints until mobile came out. Then you had the bandwidth constraints again. Then everyone went back to native versus um, because it's basically just minimizing the amount of data going over the, the telecom channel. So before we so, dive deeper into the Peapod business, I think be help, a lot of people, I'm sure, want to know where the name came from. Sure. Well, so in college, we had the Parkinson product um, business, so PP. When I um, I left Kraft to do the two years of on the board sailing team. Uh, it was using a board they call one design. So everyone sails the same board. And I wanted to design my own board. And I built one up in Maine. Um, and I was going to call that Peapod um, for Parkinson product one design. So P-P-O-D. When we first did the business plan for uh, Peapod, we actually called it iPod for information. <laughs> should have, should have trademarked you that have, one. You should have put a tr trademark yeah. on that. You would have made a lot of money. Or trademark anything, which we can tell you about. But so I, it was um, iPod. When we went to get our business cards, um, we were about to put that on the card, and Thomas said, oh, "That's a stupid name. Let's call it Peapod." <laughs> and it was sort of like P instead of PPOD, we said, "Well, it's kind of like a vegetable, like an apple is, you know, like apples." So it was kind of right then as we were filling the form out at at, at, at the Kinkos. Uh, that's <laughs> So what was the size of the online universe back then? And then talk about your early traction. Yeah, I know that about 3 to 4% of homes had a modem at that point in time. Um, and we started it online. We didn't start with phone or anything. So that was the penetration. 3 to 4%, but in the amount of time people spent was, was often very infrequent. It, it, on, on the computer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, lot, sold, yeah. we sold a lot of modems. In fact, he installed a lot of modems um, as part of the service. Yeah, and a lot of people were using modems with um, packages like Check Free. I don't know if you remember that, but your payment, like how to pay. And so it was just dial up, do a transaction, and drop off. They weren't actually doing as much online 
Um, so, so. so let's, let's talk about your go-to-market originally. So is your go-to-market trying to go at people who all have modems, people who are intensively online, that small fraction of the group, um, or is it trying to bring new people online? Like, how did you approach your go-to-market to start, and, and then what did you learn, and how did you iterate? Well, um, first of all, because it was grocery, it was very targeted, and we started actually just in Evanston, where we were part of the Northwestern Incubator. Um, so it was just the Evanston area that we were focusing, which reminds me of a, a story before I forget, is you know, before we decided to do groceries, we went to my mom, who was a uh, librarian and a teacher. So, so hold on a second. So when you started this, you weren't, even though you came from the CPG food world, you didn't, you weren't necessarily committed to. No, we wanted to, um, we wanted to sell stuff online, but get advertising dollars. Um, so we realized that grocery was very local. So that was one issue. We actually went to my mom and said, maybe we should do books. And my mom said, nah, there's no margin in books. So we, stu we stuck with groceries. Um, but very limited market and very hard to scale, obviously, because it's market by market, zip code by zip code. And we started with a um, go to market of actually picking out of the stores, much like Instacart does today, because we had no capital and we couldn't build warehouses and we couldn't access uh, product at a low, at a good price to get a good gross margin. So it was very targeted in terms of how we went to market, you know, a lot of direct mail, a lot of uh, standing in jewels every weekend, handing out flyers in that Evanston store. And wearing the costume. That got a lot of attention. Yeah. What was so, the it's the Peapod costume, so we would put that on on weekends and we would um, <laughs> hand out brochures in the grocery store and at CompUSA. Yeah, and then our wives were the shoppers. Yeah. Um, and then a couple folks here, John Purden and uh, John Prettyman had joined. Kind of we consider the four founders. Got it. So you're um, you're going to a market of three to five percent of American homes, um, and who are you finding? Like what what became that sort of foothold market that you got to? So I, I think with? one of the problems was um, you know a lot of people wanted to do it, but they didn't have modems. Okay. And we at that point had run into a guy named Casey Cowell who had started U.S. Robotics, which was the biggest modem company. And, and located near here. Yeah, located right in Skokie. Um, so he um, said he would sell us modems at cost, like the best at the lowest cost, so we could sell them to our customers. And so we had a service, which was basically me. I would go and to people's homes and install modems into their computers. Because um, a lot of people wanted the cheaper internal modem, where you had to set the IRQ switches and everything. Um, and a lot of times I'd be making a delivery also and the customer would go, yeah, I'm having trouble with my modem, so here I am, Peapod driver. And he'd go, oh, I can take care of that for you. And I'd go into their house and <laughs> fix it for them. <laughs> They're like, oh, what's the driver doing in here? I heard, um, I heard that story about the uh, Airbnb founders. They went to go interview people and they're like, well, you know, we could have professional photos taken of your house. Like, that'd be great. He said, great, let me get my camera. <laughs> they were all art students. They're like, we took photography classes, yeah. we could do this. Yeah. It's funny, our, our very first customer, uh, he was the head of the uh, research park up there, or the chairman, his name was Jerry Perlman, who was the CEO of Zenith. And I'll never forget, he came in, he gave us you know, the first dollar and took a disc, and uh, his prediction was that um, laptops would never be color for, from then on. So it shows you what happened to Zenith. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I shopped his order. I was the shopper yeah. at the time. And um, he ordered like 50 bottles of diet caffeine-free Coke. And I bought just diet Coke and we delivered 42 liter bottles, the wrong thing. And <laughs> they, they called the, um, him in the board. He was having a board meeting at the time you know, to get it all straightened out. And that was the last <laughs> time I was a shopper. Yeah. yeah so. so talk a little bit about that. Um, so how did picking work? I mean, you were, you were doing what Instacart does today. You were going into the stores. Um, talk a little bit about those two things, your delivery model and your uh, revenue model and how those evolved, how those started and then how they evolved. Yeah, so from 1990 to 97, we basically had a store pick model. So we started in one store in Evanston and then eventually expanded to about 12 fulfillment stores in Chicago. Then we started rolling out to other cities. We actually went to San Francisco, Houston, Dallas, Austin, 
Um, and we went with Stop and Shop out to uh, the Boston area. And um, all in store pick. And what we started realizing was it was very hard for us. We were getting paid basically a percent of the grocery um, dollars. And another, a very smart person joined Peapod named Mike Brennan, who's here today. And he said, you know, you guys, you need to get hold of the total gross margin of the, of the sale. So um, in about 97, 98, we um, built warehouses and then started working with the retailer to get their cost of goods so that when we sold the groceries, we'd get the full 30, 34% gross margin that would pay for all the labor that's involved um, in the operations. Got it. And at what point, um, so early on, what's your gross margin like then? But, well, it depends on what your, your denominator is, but on a $110 worth of groceries, you know, it was more like 10 to 15% because we were getting, you know, between five to $10 from the um, consumer. And initially we got nothing from the retailer and then we started to get about 5%. And what did it cost you to deliver that? Like, what was your cost for it? Um, well, it, what's interesting is it cost us about $25. So we were losing about $10 per order. But, yeah, you know, and back then there wasn't, though soon after us, Amazon launched, there wasn't really the strategy of invest and lose to build, to gain uh, eyeballs. So we were very focused on how do you make money. Um, and so one of the ways to do that was, one, run a very efficient operation on the selection side, which... Moving to warehouses helped us do that, but also get your gross margin much higher. So talk for a minute, your original idea for revenue model was to get some of the advertising dollars. Of course, the chick, the challenge with that, rev, with that advertising dollars is, you know, it's all, it's not worth much without a lot of eyeballs. Right. Um, if you had to do it over again, would you do the same thing? Would you do it differently? You know, some of this is the stage that you were at that you could get a grocer to say yes to something like, what are the lessons learned from thinking about the revenue model side of this? Uh, well, it's, I think it, it's somewhat complicated because if you're trying to run a profitable business, which we have to try to do, then you wouldn't go for share and eyeballs and uh, raise a ton of money and communicate to your investors that you're going to lose money for quite a bit of time, which is basically the strategy that Amazon took. So we really had to... Um, focus locally. If I had to do it all over again, I probably would have picked the product like what Amazon did to that you can generate a lot of eyeballs nationally mm -hmm. versus build local infrastructure, which is very, very difficult. So you scaled before you had this centralized warehouse model. Um, how'd that work? So I can talk to that. So um, as we, each time, so remember now there was no internet at the time. So um, as we grew uh, into other cities, we had, actually had to set up points of presence, or what they called them POPs back then, so our own modem racks. So we would set modem racks up in the grocery stores so that, that our customers would have local phone numbers to call. So that, you know, we had to actually build out this infrastructure of telecom for our customers, so in San Francisco and in Columbus and in Texas. And so um, we, we were constantly having to build that, that out. And, and you know now today you could start this company. You don't none of that infrastructure is necessary to build. And then the other thing that we had to do is we had to put um, systems inside the grocery stores for picking. Um, originally we had a little Tandy laptop that its only purpose was to print the orders, and we would print the orders on paper, and they would be in the order of the aisles, and somebody would just you know shop. You know obviously today you do it on a cell phone. Um, but so we had to install hardware and, and telecom and just build out everything that just once the internet came, it, you know, we could you know, decommission all of that. So quite a lot of work. So what was that transition like for you when the internet came? And was it easier to make because of what you'd done or harder because you had so much investment in these other? Um, no, it was, I mean, it was a complete game changer for us where no longer had to give people disks, just use your browser. Um, and so writing the application was much, much easier. You could do changes that were instantly reflected to the customer versus if I wanted to do a change, I had to redistribute a disk. So that kind of slowed down your innovation. Um, and then, um, you know, it was still extremely difficult to get some customers off of the modem. So we still, in 98, still had two modems running in our data center that customers would dial into. Hmm. So it was uh, getting them off and onto the internet 
And the earlier internet was, was not as great because the browsers were, were more elementary, but by 95, you know, the browsers were good enough to start developing for it. Got it. So talk for a minute about growth. What was your growth curve like? I mean, we were doubling every year until... So what, what was your revenue year one? Like 100,000, and then 500,000, and then... 100,000, that's a lot of going up and down grocery aisles. Yeah, stuff. yeah, that's a lot of orders. Well, the average order was um, $100, so 1,000 orders. Um, but actually, that was the sort of a stub year, because that was July of 90 to the end of 90 right. was 100,000. By the time we went public in 1997, we were doing about 70 million, I think, or so. So it kind of grew it from that. And place. what were the things that really helped you accelerate that? And what were the things that made accelerating that hard? Well, I think the thing that really actually helped us is a failed financing that um, got Ahold to come in and, and buy us. Because when Ahold came in, we not only got their expertise. This is after you went public. This was after we went public. So, so why don't we talk about going public then for a minute? Okay. Um, so we went public in, in 97, 70 million in sales, losing uh, not that, you know, a few million dollars a year. And how had you been financed up till then? It, it started with family, our money, credit cards, and then um, family and friends put in about 50,000. And then the first investor was um, another Thomas Parkinson, believe it or not, up in Evanston, ran a venture company uh, called EBIC, and he put in 50,000. And then we started going to strategic um, investors. First strategic was the Tribune, and the reason they were interested in investing, and they put in about one and a half million, two million, is because they um, had all of the retailers, the grocery retailers paying for the grocery ad every week. So they, were, they had some foresight, and as you know, they bought AOL and other things to say, hey, this, this online may start taking away our advertising dollars for the flyer. Let's get invested in Peapot and learn about the business. And then it was Ameritech, and then some mezzanine investors uh, before we went public. How much had you raised? Um, probably around, I think it was about 10 to 12 million before we went public. It's not and a lot of it, money back then. Yeah, and then we went public, we raised 60 million. 60? Yeah. And what did you use the proceeds for? Well, to, to really support our operating losses at that point. Um, because we were just starting to convert into warehouses where we got the full gross margin and we were still losing money. And then also for expansion, for building warehouses. Um, and uh, smaller warehouses, we called them ware rooms, but the capital had to go into those as well. And so talk about this failed financing and how that came about and why that was a good thing. Um, so after we went public about a year or two after, we decided we wanted to expand faster. We saw what Amazon had gone public um, um, right, right before us, right? Yep. Yeah, right before us. With they had 15 million in sales at the point that they went public, and they were growing like a weed, and they were investing like a weed, and they had gone out and borrowed two billion dollars in bonds um, on, you know, increasing um, a negative bottom line. So we thought we should raise money and go faster. Uh, we raised about 200 million, I think it was, from large leverage buyout companies like Apollo and Ukaipa and others, and uh, right before we got the money, we had an unfortunate event where we lost our CEO, and um, basically the investors pulled out at that point. And we were in the process of building when they pulled out, so that put us in a bind. The good news was, though, I think if we hadn't landed up with Aho buying us at that point, we would have probably gone out of business even if we had raised that money um, because it was so capital intensive to expand as quickly as we were trying to do. So Ahold brought the merchandising, uh, they brought the expertise in grocery, which we really didn't have, and they brought um, you know, the capital to expand much more quickly. And so we grew from you know, the 70 million that we were at, or maybe a little bit more by that point, 120 yeah. million to yeah. you know, 600, 700 million today. So a couple, couple of questions around that, and then I wanna go to the um, audience questions. But um, the first one is, uh, you know, we see a lot about Instacart and you talked about Instacart's model being the model you used back then, but then you talk about how it wasn't a good model for you. So based on your experience in the, both in the business back then and your knowledge of the business now, 
Um, what's your perspective on that approach and what are the pros and cons and what do you think that implies for that business? I'm going to let Andrew answer because they're my competitor. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very objective. <laughs> well, first, I think Instacart runs a great, great company and they, the times have changed a little bit in terms of um, their ability to sign up customers much more quickly than we were able to sign up so they can access the the advertising dollars probably faster than we were able to. Um, but from the from the store pick model, I think they're going to face the same challenges that we faced um, because it's just economically very difficult to pick all the product and deliver the product um, and not get access to the full gross margin. So I think they'll also uh, will try to get access to the full gross margin. That's, you know, I work with Instacart um, as part of Ahold and that's the discussions I've had with them too is you should try to access that full gross margin if you can without alienating your customers, your retail customers. So it's a bit of a tricky wicket, but it's, it's where I think it will go. I, I would also add though, but what happens is your success um, as you grow and you're picking in store, you start to overrun the store, you start to get in the way of the store, you start to outpick the store, creating out of stocks. And so logistically, it's a real problem. So your success gets you to that point. And that's what happened to us. We were overrunning the stores. And that's when we had to pivot to warehouses. So do you think that though the picking model is a good model because it lets you build a customer base without capital? Yeah, yes, yeah. I mean, basically, it's a great way to start because you don't have to invest. It's, the store is the warehouse. Um, one of the big issues we had picking out of stores besides overrunning it is out of stocks. You know, grocers in general have a very hard time knowing exactly what their inventory is and what the demand is. So we would, his, every retailer we worked with, we'd run 10% plus out of stocks. So that's a dissatisfier to the customer. What Instacart does very well and Peapod does well is substitute, ask, you know, substitute products when you are out of stock. So that relieves some of the, some of the pain. But I, I think it is a good way to start, um, but I think it has to evolve. Can the, can the margins work when you start today? I think um, you have to, you're gonna, it's gonna be an investment spend. Um, to get the eyeballs, to get the operations picking out of store, you're going to lose more money than you make. Got it. So, so those businesses are fundamentally, I mean, you know, in theory, some of these things can be positive gross margin. Airbnb, Uber, if it's not subsidizing, can be positive gross margin. If they're competing, of course, it's hard. Um, so that's not a business you think you can, you really have to find investors who say, we'll subsidize. Yeah, I think crowdsourcing is a, you know, that crowdsourcing is going to be cheaper operationally is a bit of a fallacy. And in fact, there's a lot of pressure that crowdsource people have to become actual employees anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I think that most industries is going to struggle with the gross margin when you have to do the same kind of operation that you do with employees. Got it. Um, you talked in our pre-discussion about um, a very interesting, although maybe not very sexy topic, but um, which was that one of the money ball insights of this type of business is route density. So explain what that is, why that's important, and why that insight is one of the most important in doing any business that has dynamics like this. So from the very beginning, we realized that you know we needed to get um, orders in the same neighborhood and hopefully neighbors next to each other because we're, in the beginning we were sending cars. So if I was gonna send a car out with two orders, I wanted to make sure they were in, we had drawn out a little grid and made sure they were in the same grid area. So, um, but as we grew and we moved to trucks, now we could put you know 15 and today a lot more orders on a truck. And so you don't want that truck driving too many miles. So we actually invented, um, some technology that's really similar to airline reservations, where it's a yield management system, where we can encourage customers to take certain delivery times where we know we're building density in a neighborhood. And um, so if you're on Peapod right now, you'll notice that we might have incentives that say, hey, for a dollar off, pick this delivery time. And what we're trying to do is create density in a neighborhood so we get neighbors all to order at the same time. That, that is like the secret sauce to Peapod and making money. I mean, it's. Um, it's it just significantly lowers our transportation costs. Um, so to that end, um, one of the, the, the top rated question here, thank you for voting, that's awesome, um, which segues perfectly off the conversation we've been having. Why did Peace, Peapod survive and WebVan fail? 
I mean, I think it was it was simply a case of them over uh, reaching in terms of um, how fast they think they could build this infrastructure and attract customers, and they couldn't access yeah, kick capital. their coverage. Yeah, I mean, they ran into uh, five cities, um, built um, three hundred fifty thousand know, square foot warehouses, yeah. which was costing them probably twenty to thirty million dollars each, and they weren't signing up customers and they weren't retaining customers, um, and. So I think it just cratered when you don't have the, the metrics to show that you're making uh, That's progress. one of the things we talk a lot about is don't scale it till you nail it. But people want to scale, 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 and they underestimate how hard product market fit is to get, how not to have a leaky bucket, keep those mm -hmm. retention of customers. Um, one other thing, too, though, they came into the market for free delivery. And we knew we couldn't afford that. So, you know, we really had to over-serve our customers and just do a great job so that the $5 fee that we were charging was worth it. You know, if you do a good job, you get what you pay for, so. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, people are interested in is um, your industry and the future of it. You know, what wins in grocery? Is it price? Is it service? Is it selection? Is it quality? What is it that, you know, you think will ultimately define who wins it and why? Well, I mean, at Peapod, we, we really feel that, you know, quality is, is the key to our success. So it, what you order, you get it. When we said we would deliver, we deliver. The person who delivers is wearing a uniform and is polite. Your product is undamaged. So we, we you know, our whole promise, we call it the Peapod promise, it was from the very beginning. Actually, I think John Purton came up with it, he was in the audience. But, you know, we will, we will fix any problem. If you, you know, any problem, we will fix it. And that's, today we still do that. Um, but, you know, we may not have, um, we don't have same day delivery. Peapod's a next day delivery. But we're focused on large baskets, you know, the, the, complete, the complete basket. How do you deal with you. the thing that, I remember we talked about this before, is, you know, um, there are certain windows that are very popular in certain mm -hmm. Monday mornings or Friday afternoons or whatever. Um, you know, how do you, those tend to get sold out. Yep. Um, for people who are shopping for convenience, unless they're sitting at home all the time and they're not leaving for some reason that they can't get out, um, that can be a challenge. So how do you overcome that? Sure. So what, you were earlier. And, and, yeah. I talked about the yield management system. So the first thing that an airline will do and what Peapod does is early on, we try to encourage people to take the slots that are unpopular so that we maintain you know, open slots for the demand. We also do some sneaky things like um, we know that you're a VIP customer, a very good customer. So we might hold a slot open for you longer than maybe somebody else hmm. you know, who's got smaller orders. Um, but it's still always a challenge for us. I mean, people, everybody wants Saturday morning. Um, so we do experiment with um, a sur uh, surge pricing, uh, we've, but not very popular from our customers, but it is one way to uh, prevent people from taking you know, the delivery times. But you know, it's inevitable we sell out, and especially if we have a snowstorm, we sell out maybe a day in advance. So it's a, definitely a challenge. What's the biggest threat to your business? Um, I would say you know, we're very, very worried about Amazon Fresh. and. Um, so yeah, I, I think anybody would be worried about Amazon. <laughs> if you're not worried about Amazon, you're in an Amazon business. You're not. You're not uh, yeah. thinking. Yeah. Interesting. Um, do you still run the business like a startup? When should a startup? When should a business stop acting like a startup? Um, I, I think Peapod, we still run like a startup. I mean, we're in a big corporation, and it's now a sixty billion dollar company that we are part of because they just merged with a Belgian company called Del Hayes. Um, but what I think all, all these years, the Dutch have been really, really good about sort of being hands off for us and letting us kind of operate. We also have learned how to sort of navigate the corporate culture a little bit. And there's a little bit of, you know, ask for, don't ask for permission, just, you know, just do it. Um, and it's gotten me into trouble a few times for sure. Um, but there are controls and, you know, the, but, but they're also, you know, our source of capital too. So. Um, you know, it helps us to grow the company really quickly. We're not going to venture capitalists, we're going to corporate. Um, but um, I, I would say, you know, Ahold has been a fantastic company to be with. They have just let us maintain the, the entrepreneurial spirit. And it's why I'm still there. Um, do you see services like Peapod replacing 
or supplementing retail grocery in the long run? Um, well, I think, I think you're going to see grocery change a little bit. I mean, it's not just Peapod that's taking the business. If you look at um, Amazon, just traditional Amazon, they're stealing the center of the store right now. I, mean, I think everybody in this room is probably ordering things like shampoo and all sorts of things that you would normally get at the grocery store. So I think grocery stores are, are really feeling that pinch. So I think um, what you'll see is the center store getting smaller, but maybe the peripheral markets, you know, produce and meats and you know, all the perishables um, getting bigger. Um, but I also think you're going to see re some retailers go out of business. What does but, Ahold have in the market here? What's uh, their... Just Peapod, but on the East Coast, they have Stop and Shop, Giant in, in Maryland. So one of the questions was, would you ever see Peapod having a, a location, a physical location like Amazon Go where Ahold didn't or is always going to be the grocery brands that are... No, we location. envision going outside the Ahold retail footprint. Um, what do you consider a big mistake while working on a startup you would hope, well, yeah, what's big mistakes you may have made? Well, there's so many, it's hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, one thing about a startup is that it's very cyclical in terms of you have some really good days and you have some really negative days. I remember lying on the floor with Thomas many times in our one bedroom apartment looking at the ceiling thinking, what are we doing here? We just quit a job and uh, we just had a really bad day. <laughs> um, but perseverance is obviously key um, to make it work. And I think that's what it really takes in any startup because you're gonna go through cycles, um, some good, some bad. And it definitely takes longer than you think. And I think you should be in a startup that you wanna be in for the long run. Uh, I think if you're just in there in order to sell your company, I don't think your heart's in it. Um, and I think we were, you know, for me, you know, my heart has always been in Peapod to grow it. And so there was no question I was not going to, during the hard times, I was not going to bail. You know, um, when we had the problem, um, when we lost our CEO, Andrew said to me, you focus on the employees, I'll go find the money. You know, so it was, you know, there was just no question. That was after we'd been lying on the floor trying to figure out what we were going to do. <laughs> So um, one of the questions was an uh, interesting one, which is you all have talked about uh, lessons learned. If you had to start over, and the question isn't specific whether if you started over now or started over way back when, so take it whichever way you want. Um, what, how, would you do, how would you approach the business now knowing what you've learned? I, I think one thing is, is that I, I would never start a business where it's dependent on our own delivery force. And I think that was the one thing that Amazon had, had on us, which was you know, they were using UPS as their delivery force, which meant they could, go, they could go nationwide on day one. And for us, because we were doing all our own deliveries, we were constrained. So you wouldn't that. start with grocery again? I might not start with grocery. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have too much of an example watching what happened with others, yeah. uh, like Amazon. Um, that was a great strategy. It was not a clear strategy when they started that the capital markets would support it but um, they figured it out. And as you know, they don't really make much money on the selling of products, they make it on the other services like AWS. And so, so let me ask you a question that wasn't in here, but I'm curious about. Um, you're both smart entrepreneurs, you've started lots of different businesses. We talked to you earlier, your new, new business. Um, item Master. At, yeah, Item Master at, at Opening X. But um, you've been with Ahol 18 years? Um, no, yeah. well, 18 years of yeah. Ahold. Eight, 18 you, uh, years. Yeah. And, you and know, I was six, 16. 16 years. So were you ever tempted to say everything we've learned, we want to go, we're going to go do it again, but pick a different segment or do something? You chose to, like, for people who went from idea to idea to idea as younger people, you chose to stick with this one after corporate ownership. What is it that, I guess, made you want to do that? And what is it, and how close did you ever come to saying, oh, we should go do this, but with the lessons we've learned? Well, you know, early on, I had read a, a quote. Um, I think it was Churchill or, or Teddy Roosevelt, and it was something to the effect of, I'd rather try and fail a thousand times than dwell in that dim twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. So I was in it for victory. Um, and I had just read that book, um, Built to Last, like in 1994. 
and I've always been committed to build a company that will last um, um, for a number of reasons, but it's, you know, it creates jobs and um, it provides a good service that, you know, wouldn't be around if it wasn't built to last. So that's why you, know, you want to stick around and build something versus just flip it. And, and you know, I'm not just Mr. Personality, but I'm also the emotional brother. <laughs> and um, <laughs> for me, when you're, we started the first e-commerce company in the world. That's, to me, something that I don't ever want to fail. It's a huge legacy for us. And so my heart is totally into making sure that we last forever. You know, so. That's great. Yeah. But it says a lot about you in the desire to complete it because it may or may not have been in your financial interest. Certainly, there's a lot of glamour that goes with all the new things that happen. And so that really says a lot about who you are. That you've, you've well, stayed I think commitment. my biggest pride is when I see a Peapod truck driving around, and not just in this neighborhood. When I'm out east, you see them everywhere, um, and so and my kids see them, you know. So it's a real proud pride moment for me. Um, so talk for a minute now. You're both um, at an interesting stage of your career, which is um, you don't seem like the retiring types. Um, <laughs> you're uh, you have a lot of energy, a lot of wisdom gain. But at the same time, um, you've been with this one for a long time. You've got Item Master, which you're chairman of. Um, what do you see the future holding for each of you? Do you see yourselves following the, you know, stay with uh, making this vision and taking it as far as it can go, the original Peapod vision? Do you see yourself being more of a chairman type? Do you see yourself founding and maybe even operating again? Like, how do you see that next chapter? Because you're young enough you can do anything. You've got enough experience that you bring a lot to it. But on the other hand, you've been doing it for a long time. And so, you know, maybe that a change of pace is nice. What, what? Well, I wrote in my um, personal goals. I just want to, full disclosure, my boss is in the audience. So <laughs> I have to be careful about what I say. But I put into my personal goals that I wanted to kiteboard more often. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I definitely have things. You know, uh, I'm always working on something, uh, but I'm, I'm committed to making sure Peapod, you know, survives and is, you know, we're in this battle right now. We're right in the heat of it against Amazon and a whole bunch of other, Jet, you know, Walmart Jet. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of competitors and I want to see that battle through. Sure. Yeah, and for me, um, I love sports. I love actually playing sports. Um, and to me, small business is like a sport. Every day you go in and you got to make a decision, figure something out, um, face problems, fix them. And so I'll be working forever because I love the being in the middle of it and trying to figure out and build something out of nothing. Um, so I'll be working forever. I don't think my wife will appreciate that. but <laughs> and, and I predict someday I'll be working with my brother again. So. so we always wrap up with questions that two questions that dovetail um, well with the um, last two questions that got the upvotes, which is, the first one is um, something you would never do again. Something you learned and you say, boy, did we, you know, made sense at the time, but boy, next time, if I did this again, I would never do this again. What would it be? Well, I often joke that the next company I start will have no employees. <laughs> <laughs> I know what kind of day makes you feel like that. Um, I mean, just for me, along the way, we invented so many things that people take for granted today that um, I just regret that we didn't get patented or you know, get, get on the record. I mean, really significant things that are used on the internet today. Um, so those are, that's actually sort of one of my biggest regrets is that we didn't kind of show that we invented all these things. Explain what's interesting, explain why, because of course, some people here may know Amazon has the uh, one-click patent, which they haven't tried to enforce, but it is a absurd thing to think that you click right. and buy and you get to patent that. Right. Um, but you had an interesting experience that I think could be helpful for entrepreneurs to understand as they're figuring this out, which you went to experts and said, what could we patent? Right, so we did things like, um, being able to sort your list by price, unit price, nutrition, ingredients. No one was 
So this was like revolutionary to be able to rearrange a shelf based on the preferences that you wanted, something that you do on the internet every day. Or we were the first ones to show um, ads, coupons, electronic coupons. And when we went to our lawyers, we said, you know, is there anything we can do to patent this? And they said, no, you can't patent software, really. So <laughs> we got really bad advice, um, which was really a shame. Um, and in fact, um, you should at least try to patent things because later on, patent trolls will show up and you should have something on the record that you invented something. Because we had many, many lawsuits coming our way from patent trolls. These are people who sue you. Um, they claim they have a technology. But be, so we didn't have patents. But what I did have was vid a video from 1994 that showed me demoing the product all the way through. So that's actually defended us. But I highly recommend you at least trying to patent something, because at least it's in the record now that you had that technology. Got it. What about you, Andrew? I think I'd probably try to be more knowledgeable on capital raising and, and how to go about all that. Um, as you know, it's tricky. Um, there's a lot of different forms that it can take and strategies that can be deployed. Um, you know, we watched Amazon take a very different strategy than we took and obviously it did very well with that strategy. And the last one always is um, something you did right that you say, boy, we do that again or we do it even better. What, what is something that you learned that you feel like we got right that we'd always want to do again? Well, for me, I think it's, uh, you know, that, that built the last book was all about choose a hairy goal, but create a great culture. And I think Peapod had a great culture and still has a great culture. It was all, you know, our, our way of defining it was uh, friendly people, superior service. And it's a great t team of uh, potsters, we call them. So yeah, I'm I would never, I, the friendships that I have from all the people I've worked with, the Podsters all these years, many of them who are in the audience today who go way, way back at Peapod are here to support us. And it's just, you know, it couldn't get much better than that in life than to have friends like that. Well, this has been great. Congratulations on everything and thank you. Well, thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. That was a lot of fun.